2,000 years and comes back home. It's never happened before, and we're the only ones who've done it. And we have done it because we never lost sight of who we are, and we never lost sight of the need to be different, and the ne we never lost sight of the need to come home. That is why Einstein thanked his lucky stars that he was Jewish. And we need to find ways to get our students to thank their lucky stars as well, perhaps for the same reasons. And perhaps for other things as well. Now, I'm a rabbi, let me get a little bit more religious. There are other things we can talk about as well. We can talk about Shabbat, possibly the greatest social institution ever given to the world. The idea that we have, the, that we have created this notion that one day a week we turn off from all the things around us. We stop showing our mastery over the natural world and we stop showing our slavery to technology and we become human beings and we can interact with our family and our community and our God. That's something that we gave ourselves and that's something we gave the world. We can talk about the Jewish love for learning. The fact that for us there's no secret erudite texts only known to the clergy. The fact that Jewish law and Jewish tradition and Jewish values are there for the taking for everyone. And the fact that the greatest ideal of a religious Jew is to be a learned Jew. And perhaps one of the worst things to be is an ignorant Jew. And we can show our children that. And it's something of which we can be very proud. And in general, we can talk about how we don't leave our ideals and our values as platitudes and lofty aspirations out of reach. But we make them concrete. We turn them into mitzvot, we turn them into halachot, and we turn them into din. And where do we get the idea from, for instance, that we should care about other people and we should have a passion for social justice? From this week's Sedra that said when you harvest your field you leave the corner and you let other people come and take it. And it's these concrete realities that bring heaven down to earth. And we can tell our students about that. And we can make them proud and excited at the beauty of what it is to be Jewish. But then I would say something else. That being Jewish is in some respects truth. It represents a truth. I reject the idea of selling our students, our young people, <coughs> Jewish culture. And I reject it for three reasons. First of all, I don't believe in Jewish culture. I think Jews have a lot of habits that we picked up from our host nations all over the world. But that doesn't make them Jewish in an intrinsic sense. We have Jewish food, but the very variety of Jewish food across the Jewish communities around the world shows that it's not intrinsically Jewish. We have Jewish music, which is exactly what the host culture was playing 20 years ago, and we're just following a little bit behind. <laughs> Dress, which as we know was adopted from Poland or from the Middle East or all sorts of places. The next thing about Jewish culture is it's not enough to answer the ultimate question. I can have my culture and I can marry somebody else with a different culture, and we can nicely blend the culture together. And the third thing about culture is if it's really worth preserving, then it can be preserved in a museum, which is the best place to look after culture. It doesn't have to be preserved in my life. It doesn't have to affect my life or my degree of engagement with the community. So if Judaism is not culture, if being Jewish is not just a social construct, what is it? I think it has to be something which is intrinsically true and not just a matter of a lifestyle choice. <laughs> Now, I'm aware that many people in this room come from different philosophical approaches, and they will have many different versions of what that truth is, some of which I might differ with. But I would say what we have to give to each of our students is something which is true, something which is not just a choice, a fashion, a fad. And I would suggest there's one thing on which we can all agree, and that is we find that truth in Jewish learning. We are the people of the book. Let's make sure our students open the book and enjoy opening the book and engage with it. Because ultimately, Jewish values, Jewish knowledge, Jewish law, Jewish culture, to the extent that it exists, they come from Jewish texts. And for many, 
the way to engage is with the right teacher, the right instructor, with those Jewish texts. And we have to show our students that Judaism is not just a bunch of Bible stories. It's not just what they were taught in primary school and have chucked out along with all the other fairy tales that they learned in their infancy. But it's something of profound intellectual depth. Just like, in fact, even more so, all their other subjects that they study at school. And if they find the Talmud and the Mishnah too legalistic and not relevant enough, well, how about the greatest book ever sold, containing the greatest tale ever told, the Bible itself? And the Bible is ours. And the Bible is a good book. And the Bible is worth interacting with. But again, not on the level of Bible stories, but on the level of literature, on the level of deconstructing the text, on the level of engaging with the text through the student's own eyes and through the eyes of our classical commentators and our modern commentators and our midrashim. And we know as educators what an exciting experience and intellectual journey that is. And let's make sure we can share that journey with our students. And then they can see that Judaism is so much more than just a few habits, a few bits of lifestyle that they picked up from their parents. And maybe that is part of the ultimate answer to the ultimate question of why stay Jewish. Because it's real, because it's true, because it's profound. But I want to add one more thing. I said there was going to be two things and a third, and here comes the third. I mentioned on the, at the Seder table we talk about the Mara, the bitterness, but we talk about the matzah, the triumph of the exodus. There's something else that we have to talk about as well. And that's the Pesach, the sacrifice itself. And when we tell the story, when we pass on the beauty and the truth and the reality of being Jewish to our children, we have to talk about the sacrifice. We live in a very blessed age. We live in a wonderful country. Contrary to the experiences that our parents and our grandparents knew well, no door is closed. No profession is barred to Jews. No golf club has a line saying no Jews. We've made it. We can go anywhere and we can do anything. And we're very thankful. And we pass on that sense of pride and that sense of opportunity to our children. But sometimes we forget that, you know, being Jewish doesn't mean that we can do everything. There are no impositions from outside society, but there should be from us. We need to tell our children <coughs> that being Jewish means there are some things you have to give up. From a religious level, from a social level, from an ideological level, there are some things where we have to say, yes, it will be nice to do that, but you know what? We can't, because we're Jewish. And if we get that message across, then when the question is asked, but why should I give up my non-Jewish girlfriend, boyfriend? Which is sometimes asked to parents who have never, unfortunately, given up anything for being Jewish, and have never encouraged their children to give up anything for being Jewish, when that question is then asked, but why should I give up the thing that is most important to me, if we have taught them that actually there's a sense of sacrifice, that there are some things that we can't have because we are Jewish, there are some things that we sometimes have to give up, then that ultimate question perhaps can be answered. We can tell them that there are times when people have to give up their livelihoods in order to keep Shabbat. There are times when people had to give up entry into society for the sake of their Jewish identity. And there are times, still times, when people their age, maybe even people they know well, have to stand on the front line on the borders of the state of Israel and risk their very <coughs> lives. And our young people don't have to do any of that. Although maybe if they move to Israel, they will have to do some of that. But nevertheless, we have to show them. But even in their lives, let them not be mistaken into thinking that because every door is open, that means they have the right and the need to go through every door. And so, I would suggest that in order to answer the question of why be Jewish, amongst the answers that we have to give our students, our young people, our children, are a sense that Judaism, being Jewish, being part of the Jewish community, is beautiful. 
it's not a burden, it's a privilege. A sense that it somehow relates to a truth. It's not just a choice that you can pick up or put down. And if you put it down, you're giving up something very real and very precious. And that being Jewish sometimes means giving up things. And don't be surprised that as you go through life, there are choices you'll have to make. And we want to give them the power to make the right choice, to give up some things, but to stay Jewish. We talk a lot about Jewish continuity, and we as educators are on the front line of Jewish continuity. And it's often phrased in a particular way, will we have Jewish grandchildren? It's a very real question. And the answer is very unclear. But let's put it in a slightly different way. We're educators and we have different types of children and different types of grandchildren. I would hope that if we manage to meet this ultimate challenge of our age, to answer this ultimate question, that we can ensure our type of continuity. That our students will stay Jewish. And our students' students will stay Jewish. And our students, students, students will stay Jewish from here to eternity. Thank you very much.